judgment according to us, typically. That person talks different than I do. Their culture is different from mine. They're socially awkward, unlike me. They deal with mental health issues. They can't speak English well, etc. Any number of categories. And I'm sure, I'm quite sure that many of you are critiquing me right now. My speaking ability, my appearance, you name it. We all think about these things. It's okay. Or maybe this guy is such a boring preacher. I don't know. And while categories in and of themselves are not negative, it's human, it's human nature to observe things. We make this subtle shift simply from observing to being suspicious or afraid and deciding that someone else is other, different, and more importantly, usually inferior, right? And we are familiar. We ourselves are familiar and superior. A thousand thoughts can flow through our heads in a second of conversation, right? A second. You just, a thousand different things that you think about a person, where they're from, what they look like, how they're talking, you name it. And that judgment is made just as quickly, that transition from observation to separation, right? We mix the mortar and lay bricks in our mind. And a lot sooner than we think, we've built a wall between us and them. Us and the other, right? And we become tribal and cliquish and standoffish and separated. And in groups like this church, the odds are stacked even further against us because we see each other fairly frequently. And as relationships go on and hurt and letdown and frustration are in hurt, hurt, I'm sorry, those are inevitable, right? Hurt, letdown, frustration, anytime we have a relationship with someone, it's inevitable. And when we're hurt or frustrated or let down or whatever, fill in the blank, underappreciated, a thousand other things it could be, we have this tendency to start mixing the mortar again and lay another, brick, lay another layer of bricks. And even people who we didn't mark off right away become distant, separated. Even people whom we loved dearly begin to fade away from that love. And those walls that we built over the hours and days and years really begin to get big, and they close in on us. And there's no windows in those kinds of walls, so it gets darker and darker. And we reach out, and you only feel the cold, coarse stone on your hand. Loneliness. In our critique, judgment, and separation from people, we have successfully marked out the other or our knee-jerk reaction to our pain. We've separated ourselves, and now surrounded by a beautiful tapestry of people and cultures and ideas, we ironically and sadly feel alone, even though we're in this great barrier reef of people. Sadly, this is typical. This is human nature, to divide. And there's a lot more ways to do it than what I just described. I can't go over everything, but think jealousy, ambition, power grabs, greed, ourselves, unchecked generally speaking. People have an uncanny ability to create division amongst themselves, and we do it every day. And it's very much like God to upend typical humanity, isn't it? To take broken things and broken systems and broken people and restore them to something marvelous, something beautiful. He does that with people individually, as many here could tell you. But he also does it with people as a community, his community, the church. God takes our bent towards separation and division and makes us something whole, something well-lit and warm and comfortable. He empowers us to break down those walls that we build to separate us, and he himself unites us. And it's a sad irony to me that I've rarely ever heard sermons on the topic of unity in the church, because the entire New, Test New Testament is literally laden with this topic and its importance to us as a community. I think part of the reason that we don't talk about it much is because we're so familiar with disunity. It's, it's kind of the MO, it's how we exist, right? We're so familiar with disunity and separation and division that it seems like unity is optional. Encouraged by scripture, but optional. 
the vision is so much the status quo that it becomes okay. But the reality of the matter is that because of who God is, his character, his being, our accepting division amongst ourselves and in the church at large is in a sense betraying God and denying the reality that he created through Jesus for us. And that reality of unity and ultimately love is what we're going to look at. And it's so important, it's so foundational, it's so critical to our existence as a community, as God's community, that it's everywhere in the New Testament. So we're going to be looking at a lot of different passages. And we're going to start out first by asking the question, who is God? A question you could talk about for years. But we'll take five minutes and look at what some authors say. Consider the Apostle Paul. Most of us are pretty familiar with him. Or at least as much as you know his story. All the hardship, all the suffering, imprisonment, torture, shipwrecks, being stoned and left for dead, all this he did for Jesus, right? He is a super-duper Christian, if ever there were one. And he did this so that people would know Jesus and be welcomed into the family of God. This man of God, who saw Jesus with his own eyes, told the church in Ephesus in chapter 3, this is Ephesians 3, he starts out a prayer and he says, this is the thing. This is the, I, the super impressive apostle who everybody looks to and we preach, passage, we preach sermons on my letters 2,000 years later. This is the thing that I'm praying for you, the church in Ephesus. He wouldn't say that, but it's true. All that bit about him being awesome. He says, this is what I want you to grasp. It's Ephesians 3, starting at verse 14. For this reason, for this reason, I kneel before the Father, from whom his whole family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being. Okay, why, Paul? It's a long sentence. Why? So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. Okay, check. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have the power together with all the saints, to grasp how wide and how long and high and deep is the love of Christ, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge, so that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Paul says he prays for them that they're filled with God's fullness. Okay, well, who is God, Paul, and what does that mean? Imagine God. Imagine God in all his glory, all his splendor, all his power, commanding heaven, and it obeys. Earth trembling at his presence. Imagine that. Imagine God. And consider what Paul says in verse 19 that we just read. What constitutes being filled with the fullness of God? What is our being filled with God's fullness? Knowing the love of of Christ. Isn't that incredible? Of all these awesome things that we could think about for God, Paul says, I want you, super, super awesome apostle Paul says, I want you to understand the love of Christ. This is what I'm praying for you, church in Ephesus. Understand the love of Christ. You do that, you will be filled with God's fullness. God's fullness. That is who God is. The apostle John says it even more plainly. 1 John 4, 16, a very familiar verse. We know and rely on the love that God has for us. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God, and God in him. Love. It's who God is. It's a defining characteristic, defining trait of who God is. So that is who God is. God is love. Now, who are God's people? Who are God's people? Bear with me as we go over a brief history of time in answering that question. It's a long story. And we'll start with Abraham, right? Big moment in Genesis. God makes a covenant with Abraham. Most of us are familiar with it. Genesis 12. If, if you're not, you can read it. Um, obviously won't be able to go in depth on all this stuff. And he says this. I'm choosing you as a special vessel, right? I'm choosing you, Abraham. I'm going to make a covenant with you. And the scope is the whole world. You will be a blessing to all the nations, right? I want to bless all the nations through you, Abraham. That's the beginning of the covenant. And then Abraham has Isaac. Isaac has Jacob. Jacob has 12 sons. Jacob's name gets changed to Israel after a very significant encounter of God. 
his 12 sons become basically the patriarchs of their 12 tribes, and this is how we get the 12 tribes of Israel. It was a group that was defined, chosen by God to carry out his task in the world, and it was defined largely ethnically, not exclusively, but largely ethnically. They were all related. They all traced their heritage back to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They were defined morally. You can think like Ten Commandments here. They had to follow God's laws, and also ritually, right? God made a big deal about his temple being in Jerusalem, etc. They had to obey the ritual stuff as well. And these were, the people of com- these, these were the people of promise. God made a covenant with Abraham. They were the people of God. They identify with God and his law. And in turn, God says, I identify with you, my chosen people. You, I'm with you. And then a long time later, skipping thousands of years, we get to Jesus, right? Enter Jesus, God's son, the Messiah, the promised one of Abraham to redeem the world from its brokenness. Jesus selects for himself, not ten, not 600, not 42, great number, but 12, 12 disciples. And the number is more than just a coincidence. Just like the 12 tribes of Israel, which had Israel, their father, in common, so too these 12 disciples have Jesus at the center. It's symbolic. Jesus is reorganizing the people of God around himself, and he is now at the center. He's at the center of the people of God. He's the foundation for who God's people are. And as we continue at light speed, we know that he died for our sins to redeem the world and was raised to life, and we have new life in him. He returned to be with God and gave his disciples his spirit, God's spirit. It's the beginning of Acts. Or as we say, the Holy Spirit, right? This is me with you. I'm giving you my very spirit now. That's what he told his disciples. So go. And so they, his disciples, went. And then the rest is the book of Acts. Right? So start, what started with the disciples moved to the whole world, the non-Jews. Just as Jesus said, make disciples from all the nations, not just Israel. Right? It was more than just a Jewish thing. and every, It was an everyone, every country, every people, all over thing. Through Jesus, God was drawing the whole world to himself. Think back to Abraham. The whole world to himself. And so the whole world was indeed being blessed through Abraham. Now, considering with that big picture reality of where the church came from, listen to how Paul describes this group of people who follow Jesus, God's people. So this is where the church came from. This is how it started, through Jesus. And now Paul's talking to the church in Ephesus. This is from chapter 2, and this is what he says. Therefore, remember that formerly you who are Gentiles, this is actually the passage right after what Ing read, uh, saved by faith through grace, not from yourselves. He continues here. Therefore, remember that formerly you who are Gentiles, that is not Jewish, by birth and called uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circumcised, the Jews, remember that at that time you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel and foreigners to the covenants of promise. Remember, covenants, Israel, Jacob. Without hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ, you who were once far away, have been brought near through the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made the two one and has destroyed the wall, the dividing wall of hostility, by abolishing in his flesh, that is on the cross, in his flesh the law with all its commandments and regulations. His purpose, listen to this, his purpose was to create in himself one new man out of the two, thus making peace. And in this one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross by which he put to death their hostility. He came and preached peace to you who are far away, that is the Gentiles, separate, excluded, and peace to you who are near, the Jews. For through him we both have access to the Father by one spirit. Consequently, okay, what's the conclusion, Paul? Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and aliens, but fellow citizens with God's people and members of God's household built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets with Christ Jesus as the cornerstone. Remember, he reorganized the people of God around himself. Christ Jesus as the cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become the holy temple to the Lord. And in him, you two are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. Once excluded, now included, united in Christ, Jesus reorganized the people of God around himself, and this is God's household. Paul ends with the metaphor of a building. 
You guys are all one unit now. You're one structure. There's no room for dividing over heritage or background. And consider this. Consider that Jesus died to make that a reality. That's what it says in verse 16. Through the cross, Jesus made this happen. He died to make us all one and united in him. And it's not just the Jews and Gentiles who are united. It's anyone and everyone. That's what Paul focuses on in in Ephesians. But listen to what he says in Colossians. Here, he's saying in the church, this is Colossians 3. Here, there is no room for Greek or Jew. Okay, we talked about that. Circumcised or uncircumcised, same thing. Barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. Barbarian, that was a pejorative term used by the Greeks for anyone who couldn't speak Greek, right? Scythians, it was a nationality. Don't know much about them. Slave or free, socially or economic status. Just like us, people back then made distinctions and built walls, whether it was race, whether it was language, whether it was class, whether it was religious background. But Paul says, none of it matters, none of it matters in this new people Jesus created. He is in every single one of them, from the 10-year-old slave to the emperor of Rome. Anyone who follows Christ, anyone who would follow Christ, Christ gives him his spirit and his new life. Paul says elsewhere in Ephesians that there is one God, one faith, one baptism, one spirit. Everyone is united. There is no room for distinction. There is no hierarchy of spiritual privilege. And whatever distinction separated you before simply does not matter. Does not matter. And so we are robbed of whatever right we had to divide over such issues. God has put his seal of approval on the entire family, right? Anybody who follows Christ receives the Holy Spirit. God puts his seal of approval. He says, yes, I'm attached to this one. Just like he told Abraham, I'm going to be attached to you. And he says, anybody who follows Christ, I'm attached to that person. And so we can't make a judgment where God hasn't made one, can we? We can't trump God with our desire to separate over issues. I mean, some of this stuff is just so relevant. Like barbarians, again, it's like it it was a bad name they called people who couldn't speak Greek. And think about the attitudes of some people in this country toward people who can't speak English. And it becomes this very hotly politicized issue. But at the same time, in the church, there's no room for it. There's no room for it. Anybody who you look at is part of the family if they profess Christ. That's it. Done. United. Level playing field. No more walls. And Jesus died to make that a reality. He died to make that vision from God in the beginning a reality. This united, obedient, faithful, loving people reflecting him, the loving God, to the world. And this is why our unity is such a big deal. Because we're reflecting God to the world. So in light of that reality, of the unity of the church, it makes sense that the prevailing metaphor in the New Testament to describe the church is that we are a family. That's the most popular one. We're a family. We're in God's family. Um, In Ephesians 1, Paul says we're adopted as sons and daughters. He says the Holy Spirit is a guarantee of our inheritance, which is something that you only receive from a family member, an inheritance, right? Um, 1 John 3, 1, see how great a love the Father has bestowed on us that we would be called children of God, and such we are. We are his children. There's a family. Ephesians 3, the passage that I read to start out, it says his whole family, from God's from whom God's whole family is, is united and knitted together. And then finally, probably the most prevalent example of this is how the authors of the New Testament, New Testament consistently address people in the churches as brother and sister. Right? It's more than just a term to throw around, and it's become so familiar that it may have lost its meaning to us. But it means something. Actually, brother and sister. It means that when I look at another person who professes Jesus, if I look them in the eye, I'm looking at my brother my brother, my sister. I don't have a choice in the matter, actually. And I think that's the rub. God made it real in Jesus. And I have no position or place to deny it. This person is my brother, my sister. It doesn't matter how long I've known them. It's a fact. To break down those walls that we build between us, we make a choice. I think this is what it comes down to for us as believers. To break down those walls, we make a choice. We choose to see and treat fellow 
believers as family. We're not. We choose to treat them like family, to be a family, to care for one another, support one another, cry together, celebrate together. And it's amazing. Only God could do this in a world where people are different and foreign countries are treated at best with suspicion. In Christ, every wall is broken down. And we, all the people of the world, are united together just like we choose to abstain from those things that God tells us to, like lying or reckless ambition. So we must choose to see each other as family and to treat each other as family because that is a reality that Jesus died for just like my being holy and living a holy life, which is easy to think about. I think in church culture we think about you know, living a holy life consistently, you know, not lying, not stealing, or whatever. A thousand different things we could list off. But this is talked about ten times as much as that is. And it's not an option, right? We have to see each other as family and be a family precisely because of who God is. God is love. And he united us together. He put his stamp of approval on every single person that follows Jesus. And we have no right to judge. So we must choose to treat each other as family. And that is so hard to do. That is so hard to do. You have to fight every moment to maintain that perspective. Because again, think about it. When you first meet somebody, a thousand different thoughts in your mind. You're already making judgments. You're already putting them into categories, right? Again, it's, it's human nature. It's observation. But we have to choose not to separate because of them. We have to choose each other because of Jesus and because of what he did. And because he said, I love this person. I have no right to say, I'm going to distance myself from that person. Thank you very much. I have no right. I can't. It's not an option. And so as a family, if anyone is in need, if anyone is struggling, if anyone is suffering abuse, if anyone needs help, needs somebody even to just have a voice, that's what family members do for each other. They stick up for each other. You can picture like an older brother sticking up for his younger brother. And that's the kind of thing that we can do for each other as family. God made it so. And the beautiful thing is, is that when we do treat each other as family and we actually allow ourselves to be intimate and know each other better, so many of the other things that we're supposed to do as Christians, um, like encourage each other, exhort one another, teach, pray. I mean, you can think of like a hundred different examples throughout the New Testament of like, hey, do this, do this, do this, pray for each other, whatever. So many of those things just begin to happen naturally, <laughs> right? Family members encourage each other. And I, I don't know about you guys, I've been rebuked by my mother before. <laughs> uh, it's that kind of thing, right? If we're doing the wrong thing, it's not like we should always do that. But when we become a family, all this stuff kind of falls into place, and we don't have to just, like, think about this big, long list of, like, what am I supposed to do? What am I supposed to do? What am I supposed to do? We're going to be a family. A family that is united around what? Jesus. That's what he died to make, this reality, this people of God. He died to make the people of God reality in this beautiful, united And so we're united as a family. What is the one thing that is going to hold us together instead of letting us tear apart as we are so prone do to doing? What is the thing that's going to hold us together as a family in a tangible way, in more than just a lip service way? It's love, right? It's got to be. Remember, remember Paul's prayer at the beginning, being filled with the fullness of God? Remember John emphasizing God is love? So, Paul, we read that passage from Colossians about no more barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all in all. This is, this is how he continues. This is right after that. He says, therefore, okay, this is the result. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, Clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And listen to this. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Love. Love is the glue that keeps this very diverse family together, this almost impossible family together by worldly standards. The fact that we would actually be united as a family and love each other, being so different in our upbringing, in our backgrounds. It's not just culture. It's not just country, what country you're from. I mean, even your neighbor. <laughs> we divide ourselves from people who are so much like us. Why? Because we begin to just make more and more distinctions between us and them. It's always us and them, us and them, us and them. They're weird. 
or whatever. I don't know. Uh, but love is what binds us together. Love, right? This is the therefore. This is the conclusion. This is the, okay, there's no division. So what do we do? We have to love each other. Over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them together. Binds them together in perfect unity. It makes sense, doesn't it? Since God is love. Love is the glue. Without it, we fragment, we separate, we close off, we dismiss, we suspect, we distrust, and we leave each other. That's, that's the normal thing that humans do. Love is who God is. Love is what binds us together as people who say that we follow Jesus. But more than being something that is mandatory or required, because sometimes we can tend to think of things that we should do that way. I should do this. This is required. It is something that defines God's people. Love defines God's people. Listen to the Apostle John in 1 John 4. It's a very familiar passage, and it's so simple that we often miss it. Right? Dear friends, he says this, Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. It's defining. This is how God showed his love among us. What's God's love like? He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. And if you're choosing to show that kind of love to someone else, just think about it. I can make a choice to love that person, right? Dear friends, since God so loved us, we ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us, and his love is made complete in us. We know that we live in him and he in us because he has given us his spirit. Remember, stamp of approval. I'm giving my spirit to these people. And we have seen and testified that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. If anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of God, God lives in him and he in God. Pay attention there. Paul, John's made two statements so far. God lives in him and he lives in God. And it was about two things. If anyone acknowledges Jesus is the Son of God, okay, so faith, we can, we can picture that, right? But two, if, you're, if, if they're a loving person, that was part of, John's orthodoxy, right? I think we can think about in, in Christian circles a lot of times, you know, who's in and who's out based on uh, theology, essentially, like the Apostles' Creed, you know, believe in the virgin birth and, and whatever. That's what we were talking about, Sam. Um, and for John, he says, but you also, like, if, it, if, they're, if they're completely not a loving person, chances are they don't know God, right? And I think I've known plenty of people who would say, like, born again when I was 12 or whatever, and live lives completely opposite of love. And John says here, chances are they don't know God because God is loving. And to, to, to know God means that you have to be like him, right? He has to speak in your life that way. There's that connection. And so we know, verse 16, and so we know and rely on the love God has for us. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in him. In this way, love is made complete among us. Verse 19, we love because he first loved us. If anyone says, again, it's almost like he's repeating himself, but that means that's how important it is. If anyone says, I love God, yet hates his brother, he is a liar. For anyone who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And he has given us this command. Whoever loves God must also love his brother. Just like Sam read the passage from Matthew. Teacher, what is the greatest commandment of the law? Well, there's two. You have to love God and you have to love your neighbor. Sums up the law and the prophets. That's what Jesus said. And it's so simple, but it's so foundational that I think we can skip over it because we we just kind of take it as a check mark. Oh, yeah, I know I'm supposed to be loving. And John here says, like, no, it, it has to define us. It has to define us. We don't just have to, we, we can't just know that we're supposed to be loving. We have to be loving. We must be loving. Because it's who God is. And we are his people. God is love, so if you know God, you'll be like him. And since we're gathered here this morning as a group of believers, 
I think it's God that we're thirsting for. That's probably the reason most of us are here this morning. We, we love being with God, right? And here he is on full display in 1 John 4. Love, a radical love for you and creating a, la- a radical love in you for others. This is God. This is who we want at the end of the day. This is who we want is God. And as we seek as a church to be on mission, right? We love Jesus and we want people to know Jesus. As we want to be on mission, so we're looking outward now, telling people of Christ, God's unfathomable pardon, his deep love, his costly forgiveness. As we do that, our genuine love for each other will illuminate and give warmth to the gospel message. Just like Jesus said in John 13, they will know you are my disciples by your love for one another. This is how the Hindu, the Jews, the pagans, the Muslims, the distant questioners, the resolute atheists, the hurt agnostics, this is how they'll know your love for one another. Warmth, you know, it's, it's something you feel, love flowing throughout a community, your community. It would be like a bonfire burning in the middle of a frozen tundra. That's the image that gets in my head when I think of just a vibrant, loving, united family centered around Jesus. All cultures gossip, all lie, all suspect, all keep their distance, all betray. But we are God's kingdom here on earth. That's what Jesus said. And Jesus Christ overcame all of it on the cross for us so that we could be made like him and be him to the world. And that's our calling. And that's who we are as a family. We are a family. Every single person in this room who professes Jesus, welcome. (laughs) You're part of the family. Just like you weave a beautiful tapestry. In conclusion, this is, this is the image in my head. Just like you weave a beautiful tapestry with many colors, shades, fabrics, materials, God has so ordained that in Jesus, he would weave together a vastly diverse group of people to be his followers. Vastly diverse. People from different time periods, countries, Jungles, cities, educated, impoverished, politicians, day laborers, tribes, Republicans, Calvinists, you name it. I could list off a hundred different things that we divide over. All these people he would weave together to be his. And just as love is a defining characteristic of God, love would have to be the very thing that holds that group of people, that tapestry together. That's how it stays fit together. We must love each other radically or we will slip into division and disunity and the clan-like mentality that we so easily adopt about race, politics, theology. We just form clans. Whatever else. Along with the rest of the world, this is typically how people function. And through Jesus, we can stay together. We can. We don't have to be controlled by the system of fear and distrust and separation, building walls, as we're so accustomed to doing. We can choose to see everyone who follows Jesus as part of the family and live in the abundance of love that Jesus provided for us, that he died so that we would experience that warmth, the love of God. This is who God is, flowing in this community. For like the hundredth time in Ephesians, Paul encourages encourages them toward love. It's like everywhere. And as we transition to our time of communion, I encourage you to reflect on these words. It's from Ephesians 4. As a prisoner for the Lord, then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort, make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body, not six. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all.